Welcome to Brainish English Stories. Me and old Mac Lonsbury, we got out of that little hide and seek gold mine affair with about forty thousand dollars apiece. I say old Mac, but he wasn't old. Forty-one, I should say, but he always seemed old. Andy, he says to me, "I'm tired of hustling. You and me have been working hard together for three years." Say we take a break for a while and spend some of this idle money we've earned. The idea sounds good to me, says I. Let's enjoy our wealth for a while and see how it feels. What do you think? Visit Niagara Falls or try our luck at gambling? For a long time, says Mac. I've thought that if I ever had a lot of money, I'd rent a small cabin somewhere, hire someone to cook. And relax while reading Buckle's History of Civilization. That sounds like a nice and simple way to enjoy life, says I. I don't see how money could be better spent. Give me a cuckoo clock and a banjo instruction book, and I'll join you. A week later, me and Mac arrived in a small town called Pena, about thirty miles from Denver. We found a nice two-room house that suited us perfectly. We deposited some of our money in the Pena bank and greeted all three hundred and forty citizens in the town. We brought along our cook, the cuckoo clock, Buckle's book, and the banjo instruction book from Denver. They made our cabin feel like home right away. Never believe it when they tell you that money can't buy happiness. If you could have seen old Mac sitting in his rocking chair with his feet up, reading Buckle's book through his glasses. You would have seen a picture of contentment that would have made anyone jealous, and I was learning to play songs on the banjo. The cuckoo clock was chiming on time, and our cuckoo sing was filling the air with the delicious smell of ham and eggs. When it got too dark to read or play music, me and Mac would light our pipes and talk about various topics like science, travel, and gratitude. One evening, Mac asked me if I knew a lot about women. Why? Yes, says I. I understand them pretty well. I'm familiar with their behavior and differences. I tell you, Andy, says Mac with a kind of sigh. I never really understood women. Maybe I might have been interested in them before, but I never took the time. I've been working since I was fourteen, and I never seemed to understand how to relate to them. I sometimes wish I had," says old Mac. "They're difficult to understand," says I, and different from each other. Although they have their reasons, I've found them to be quite different from one another. It seems to me," goes on Mac, "that it's better for a man to understand women when he's young." I missed my chance, and I guess I'm too old now to learn. Oh, I don't know. I tell him, maybe you should appreciate having money and freedom from worries. Still, I don't regret knowing about women. I say, it's important for a man to understand them to take care of himself in this world. We stayed in Pena because we liked it. Some people might enjoy spending money on excitement and travel. But me and Mac had enough adventures. The people were friendly. Asing learned to cook our favorite food. Mac and Buckle were good friends, and I enjoyed playing the banjo. One day, I received a telegram from Spade, the man who was working on a mine I was interested in in New Mexico. I had to go there, and I was gone for two months. I couldn't wait to get back to Pena and enjoy life again. When I arrived at the cabin, I was shocked. Mac was standing in the doorway, looking completely different. He was wearing fancy clothes and had a big flower pinned to his jacket. "Hello, Andy," says Mac with a big smile. "Glad to see you back. Things have changed since you left." "I can see that," says I, "and it's a strange sight. This isn't like you, Mac Lonsbury." Why are you dressing up like this? Well, Andy says he. They've chosen me to be the justice of the peace since you've been gone. I looked at Mac closely. He seemed excited and restless. 
A justice of the peace should be calm and composed. Just then, a young lady walked by on the sidewalk. I saw Mac half smile and blush. Then he tipped his hat and smiled at her. She smiled back and kept walking. No hope for you, says I, if you're smitten at your age. I never thought it would happen to you. And fancy shoes. All this in just two months. I'm going to marry the young lady who just passed by tonight, says Mac, sounding nervous. I forgot something at the post office, says I, and hurried away. I caught up with the young lady about a hundred yards away. I tipped my hat and introduced myself. She looked about nineteen, quite young. I heard you're getting married tonight, I said. That's right, says she. Do you have any objections? Listen, miss, I started. My name is Miss Rebosa Red, she said, looking a bit upset. I know, says I, now? Rabosa, I'm old enough to have owed money to your father. And my friend Mac, who's all dressed up like a peacock with shiny shoes, is my best friend. Why did you agree to marry him? He was my only chance, answers Miss Rabosa. No, says I, admiring her beauty, you could have picked any man with your looks. Listen, Rabosa, Mac isn't the right man for you. He's much older than you. He missed his chance when he was young. He's chasing after something he missed out on in his youth. Rabosa, are you sure you want to go through with this marriage? Yes, I am, says she, adjusting the flowers on her hat, and so is somebody else, I suppose. What time is the wedding? I asked. At six o'clock, she says. I made up my mind quickly. I had to help old Mac. It wasn't right for him to marry a girl so much younger who still acts like a child. Rabosa, I said seriously, using what I know about how women think, isn't there a young man in Pina that you really like? Oh, yes, Rabosa replied, nodding, there sure is. What do you think? Does he like you back? I asked, what does he think about all this? He's crazy about me, Rabosa said. My mom has to stop him from hanging around all the time. But I guess that'll change after tonight, she sighed. Rabosa, I said, do you really have feelings of love for old Mac? No way. Rabosa shook her head. I think he's as dull as can be. No thanks. Who is this young man you like, Rabosa? I asked. It's Eddie Bales, she said. He works at Crosby's Grocery, but he only makes $35 a month. Ellen Oaks used to have a crush on him. Old Mac told me he's going to marry you at 6 o'clock tonight, I said. That's right, she confirmed. It's happening at our house. Rabosa, I said. Listen to me. If Eddie Bales had a thousand dollars in cash, a thousand dollars, mind you, enough to buy his own store, if you and Eddie had that much, would you marry him this evening at five o'clock? A thousand dollars? Rabosa repeated. Of course I would. Let's go, I said. We'll talk to Eddie. We went to Crosby's store and called Eddie outside. He seemed reliable, but he was nervous when I made my offer. At five o'clock, he asked, for a thousand dollars? Pinch me, I must be dreaming. Well, you're the rich uncle from India. I'll buy out old Crosby and run the store myself. We went inside and talked to Mr. Crosby privately. I wrote a check for a thousand dollars and gave it to him. If Eddie and Rabosa married each other at five, he was to give them the money. Then, I gave them my blessing and went for a walk in the woods. I sat down and thought about life, growing old, and the way women think. I congratulated myself for probably saving my friend Mac from making a big mistake. I knew he would be grateful when he got over his infatuation and got rid of his fancy shoes. 
Preventing Mac from making a mistake like this is worth more than a thousand dollars, I thought. And I was glad that I had learned about women and wouldn't be fooled by their tricks. It must have been around 5.30 when I got back home. I walked in and there sat old Mac in his old clothes, with his blue socks up on the windowsill and the History of Civilization book on his lap. This doesn't look like you're getting ready for a wedding at six, I said, pretending not to know. Oh, said Mac, reaching for his tobacco. The wedding got moved up to five o'clock. They sent me a note saying the time had changed. It's already done now. Where have you been, Andy? You heard about the wedding? I asked. I officiated it, he said. I told you I was the justice of the peace. The preacher is away visiting his family, so I'm the only one who can perform weddings in town. I promised Eddie and Rabosa a month ago that I would marry them. Eddie is a hard-working young man. He'll have his own grocery store one day. That's great, I said. There were a lot of women at the wedding, said Mac, puffing on his pipe. But I didn't learn anything from them. I wish I understood women as well as you do. That was two months ago, I said, reaching for my banjo.